Hello and welcome back to Spinal Cast. I'm your host, David Stevens, and joining us today is a spokesperson and TEDx speaker, founder of mobilewomen.org, um, which is actually a Facebook group now, and also co-founder of the Raw Beauty Project and their latest uh, initiative, the Raw Beauty Project Health. Uh, we have Wendy. Wendy, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited for this opportunity and to share what we're doing and get the word out there. Well, perfect. I, uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, the goal for us today is to talk about the different initiatives that you've kind of dedicated to your, yourself to over the years um, and how they're making a positive impact on the SCI community and so on and so forth into the future. Uh, does that sound pretty good to you? Sure. All right. Perfect. So just real quick for our listeners at home who might not know Wendy Crawford, uh, could you give us a little background on your injury? Just a quick synopsis of kind of what happened and 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 things like that? Sure. Uh, well, 38 years ago, when I was 19, uh, I was on the way to the airport for a job. Uh, at the time, I had just started modeling and got my first international assignment in Tokyo. And I awesome. was living in Toronto. Um, I'm Canadian originally. So on the way to the airport, uh, it was foggy and we were, we, ran, we were exiting and we were ended by a driver that had been drinking. And mm -hmm. um, our car spun out on the highway and uh, what they think happened is my suitcase flew over and hit me in the back of the neck. And so oh. I have a C5-6 spinal cord injury, which means I'm paralyzed okay. from like, the collarbones down, uh, partial use of my arms, and my hands are paralyzed. Um, and I went to rehabilitation and was in ICU and had a halo and all kinds of fun right. stuff. Um, well, that is a, uh, a truly tragic story, but, um, obviously we have you on the show because you've done quite a bit following, um, that accident and done some incredible things. Um, one of the questions I did have is given that you were, um, you know, into modeling before the injury, um, and I'm, I'm hoping you did a little bit of modeling after the injury as well. Uh, did your definition of beauty kind of Harkening back to the Raw Beauty Project uh, that you co-founded, uh, did your definition of beauty change um, from before and after the injury, or did it, you know, adapt? How how would you have described the difference between before and after when it comes to beauty? Well, I mean, when I was injured, I was I was young. I didn't think I was young at the time. <laughs> I thought I knew everything, um, but I was young and I was always a tomboy and I always felt, I never imagined myself ever modeling. I just kind of fell into it and um, I didn't have a lot of confidence. And so I was constantly comparing myself to other models and really wasn't that confident at all. And I thought, mm. I thought beauty was perfection. You know, I would see these other women and then, and we were being judged kind of like that too. I mean, this was before photo touch, you know, uh, Photoshop yeah. and things like that too. So. Well, and I feel like that's the common public opinion as well. Right. Right. That so you, there, there's this. Yeah. Unattainable kind of beauty. Exactly. You go to these auditions and they would say, Oh, you know, you're, you're not tall enough. You're not, you know, you're too tall. You're too this, you're too that. And, so, you know, it was, it was hard to take at that age and not being a confident, you know, person about my looks to begin with. Um, after the accident, I immediately, of course, felt the same way. So I was pretty devastated to have my injury. And, you know, I saw myself changing, um, not a lot physically, but somewhat. And that was devastating because, oh, no, like what I whatever I thought was perfect was not no longer changing in my body. Um, I'm in a wheelchair. I didn't know anyone with disability. I had, you know, I had no idea what this world was going to be like. It was, 
it was a whole new world. But then, um, right. you know, I, I rejected it for a long time. And I honestly, to be completely honest, was like, I don't want to be around these other people in wheelchairs. Like, I feel really badly for them, but I'm not one of these people. And I was, you know, in denial. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, after years of depression and, you know, it, I started to sink in. And I became friends with um, a lot of women with disabilities. And I started to see what they were, so, you know, they were amazing. They were capable of doing all these things. They were, they were strong and they were still, they were beautiful. And, um, and I saw more confidence in them than they did back in the modeling industry. So I began to admire awesome. that and I, I saw di disability in a different light. But, you know, that was right. years of transition before I reached that point. I think that makes perfect sense. Um, when you said you kind of connected with these other um, women with disabilities, what what avenues, you know, when it when you originally started meeting them, what avenues were you meeting them through? Well, I became a volunteer um, for research studies, and okay. I um, started to meet other people with disabilities, and then you know we would do rehab together and then go out afterwards. And um, I kind of always was watching life by the sidelines until I started doing that and thinking, you know what? I don't care if I'm in a wheelchair. I'm going to go out with these people or we're going to go have fun and do this. And yeah, gradually got more and more engaged and became more of a participant than, you know, someone sitting on the sidelines thinking. I, not that I consciously thought this, but I was kind of like, well, when I get better, I'll do X, Y, and Z. But it wasn't happening. You know, right. the years were going by and it wasn't happening. So. Yeah. Well, I think that you, it's great to hear that you made that transition in your mindset because I think um, for someone who's newly injured or, you know, anyone who's dealing with a disability, I think it's very easy to kind of seclude yourself and not get involved and have it have a difficult time finding those avenues to meet other people with, with uh disabilities yeah. or or things like that and so i think it's uh it's a cool it's a cool thing that that you were able to break out of that i know there was definitely some dark times in there but um you know it's there's definitely some positive as, as well um so kind of changing gears let's talk a little more about uh the raw beauty project if you want to just kind of let me know one, how did you, you know, maybe how did you meet the co-founders and how did the idea come about? Sure. Um, and then where, where did it start? What was the kind of like the push that got it going? Well, at one point I was living in Miami and once again, had all these friends that were, you know, had disabilities and um, mm -hmm. a, a few of them were doing this photography exhibit. And they asked if I would be in it. And I said, okay. Um, and I, I got involved helping with that. And we created a committee. And um, and it was called Raw, Raw Beauty Project Uncensored Life Raw Beauty or something. And so we decided um, after that project that we, we weren't going to continue it. And years later, I, I still wanted to do it. And I felt like if we did something similar and I wanted to do it in New York and maybe connect with some um, photographers that I knew back from when I was modeling. And so um, two of the people, Dr. Susan Solomon, who is a paraplegic and I met her through rehab in the project. And um, mm -hmm. she, and she's a, now she's a, a professor at a medical school for FIU and oh, cool. but she was a pharmacist and a podiatrist and um then a photographer Dr. Uh, jenny dixon who's a pulitzer prize winning photographer she was also on the original committee so we formed a uh, raw beauty project and we did it in new york city in 2014. Uh, and cool. then we got all new photographers and um we gathered our models from that area and just wanted to show the beauty and strength of 
one with disabilities. Um, our mission is to celebrate one with disabilities. Uh, it's an innovative art platform to celebrate one with disabilities and um, to empower and, and to educate and to inspire change. So um, we... And so like, how did those, how did those images kind of get utilized then initially? Right. Were you having them published? So we had or... different photographers. We had different photographers who had different perspectives and they worked with their models and they created um, a photograph that they felt depicted on um, beauty and strength. And mm -hmm. so um, that way each photograph was different. It wasn't, you know, the same photographer doing the whole thing. And right. um, then we had an exhibit and we printed them like, I don't know, 36 by 48 inches, these big, huge photos. And we had an art exhibit. Yeah. And um, it really took off. I mean, we were in all kinds of media, uh, Oprah magazine, the Today Show website. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, all over the world, actually. We were in Europe, you know, the UK, we were in um, Mexico, Italy. Um, it was just the right timing. And we really just wanted to show that, you know, beauty is not limited to a certain age or size or ethnicity or um, ability. And right. um, I think we accomplished that. Um, each, each photograph had the woman's, uh, a kind of a narrative about each woman and they got to kind of say what they wanted to say about themselves. It was kind of like a bio, but more um, a narrative. And we found that art and people's stories was how people connected. Um, yeah. I think it's a unique, it's a unique medium to kind of communicate the struggle or the, the pain but it also can communicate really positive things at the same time. I think right. that's something that art can do that, you know, uh, uh, certain things, other, other mediums aren't necessarily capable of doing. I think it's really easy to make a, a, a video that's really, you know, gut wrenching and, and moving, mm -hmm. but it's hard to kind of jump from that straight to something that's, you know, really positive and uplifting and art can kind of do that for the viewer really dependent on how they want to view it. Right. And we wanted to break the stereotypes and, and I think the camera was almost like a, a filter and showed the woman who, the, who they really were. And I think right. the viewer maybe wasn't able to see that before. Um, so it not only empowered the woman themselves and gave them confidence to branch out in projects they may have not have done, but also mm -hmm. the viewers, you know, we all have our disability. Ours is just visible, but we all have our obstacles in life. And so this, um, you know, just showed people that you're able to overcome them and you're able to, to shine, um, through if, if you totally, yeah. So that was kind of the purpose of that. And, um, then we duplicated it in other cities, meaning duplicating meaning, we did one in Los Angeles. So we had different photographers and different models. Each exhibit had maybe anywhere from 20 to 25 models um, and mm. photographers. So we did it in Los Angeles, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and each city we had an ambassador who kind of you know organized it in their cities. Uh, we did it yeah. in Miami. Um, that one we didn't have as many new ones, but we showed it in Miami. And um, so we were really happy to do that. And then we took a break and um, we wanted to do it, but it was co you know, COVID hit. And we were like, how do we yeah. do this project and have keep people safe? And, you know, to do photographs was difficult. And at right. the same time, you know, I was, you know, I've been going through this years and any of the women that I know, we're 
you know, we talk about, that's our best support is talking to one another. So we talk to each other and one of the things we talk about is our healthcare and how we struggle to get, you know, basic tests and um, basic healthcare. And so also- And this is kind of keying into the raw beauty health now, right? Right. Which is kind of the newer initiative. Right. Okay. Um, So did you want to go back to the other one first or- no, 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 that's, okay. this is perfect. That was the next, the next point that we were hoping to talk about. So this oh, is kind of a perfect transition. I just wanted for the viewer to, to kind of communicate the fact that even though it's, it's all kind of part from the same, but it, it starts deviating itself based on your circumstances and really where the need lies, right? Exactly. Um, and using your support group, similar to the mobile women Facebook group, I mean, mm-hmm women with disabilities are getting together and having communication about what struggles they're dealing with. And you guys are using this raw beauty project as a way of, of bringing all of that stuff to light. And right now the focus of it is kind of in the healthcare industry. Exactly. And as I said, my co-founder, Dr. Susan Solomon, who's also, you know, one of my dearest, dearest friends, we had talked about this and she teaches medical students and so she realized there was a lack of education about disabilities. So she is teaching students to be more disability competent, to um, know the questions to ask and the equipment that's used and how to even speak with someone with a disability. So she was teaching that in her class. So we decided to do Raw Beauty Project Health. And um, it was very similar in that we're still celebrating women with disabilities and we yes. want to, um, you know, empower and educate and, and um, create change. So we, what we decided to do was to get 20 something models again, but this time mm-hmm. we got them in, we wanted to show that women with disabilities are having a hard time accessing equal and accessible health care. So we chose women in all different cities across the country and they're different ages, different disabilities, different ethnicities, because we wanted to show that this problem exists. So there's about 36 million women with disabilities in the country and a third of them have reported being denied health care. Uh, at some point. Wow. Yeah. And so um, that's, that's over 12 million. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, so there, the reasons for this disparity is um, some of them anyway, is a uh, lack of accessible equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, well, um, over 90% of doctor's offices do not have weight scales that are accessible. Over um, 80% do not have accessible exam tables, um, just to give you an idea. So um, so there, there's the inaccessible equipment. There's also the fact that um, doctors themselves aren't getting this medical training for um, people with disabilities. Um, they right. aren't aware of the guidelines of what the ADA um, states in healthcare, in terms of healthcare. And also the women themselves don't realize their rights to equal healthcare. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, have this disability for 38 years and it's easy to, to just go to the appointment and kind of muddle through it. And it's difficult to get the appointment. You don't want to upset anyone and you just kind of make do, or you, you know, you don't want to, cause a problem, but you also right. don't know what you're missing. You don't know that it's important to get weighed at every appointment. It's important mm-hmm. because it's not, it shows underlying conditions. You know, it, so you think, okay, I don't have to get weighed. Big deal. I don't want to know my weight anyway, kind of thing. <laughs> but you know, you're missing out on important things, but the, the women themselves don't necessarily know that either. So we wanted yeah. to create a project that, 
um, did educate and also um, empower these women to become their own advocates. And so we found 20 something models across the country. We realized we couldn't use photographers. It was just too difficult to find photographers in each city and in the COVID. So what we did was we found artists with disabilities who um, created portraits of these women. So cool. The exhibit we created is called Unstoppable. The women are unstoppable in their own lives, but they do get stopped in base, accessing basic health care. And um, so we, uh, these artists have often experienced the same things themselves. So it was, it was right. a huge project coordinating everything, but the, the woman, um, yeah, the woman would tell us their stories. Uh, we would pull a statement from them. The woman would submit, say, five photographs, and then the artist would, um, um, those photos, um, base a portrait to put with their statement. And then we launched it in May, and we did it, um, was it April or May? We did it uh, virtually, and um, it was kind of a soft launch, and we shared their stories. And I think that is the most powerful. And I think it's the, the best way for people to connect and to feel. I think the world yeah. feels by hearing people's stories as opposed to hearing a statistic. It kind of doesn't resonate with you, you know? Yeah, no, I, I would completely agree with that. I do think there is a, um, a level of authenticity that comes with a person. Um, as an individual who can share a personal story and and experience versus a group um, saying something about another group, it's it's just a little mm-hmm. harder to push that um, you know that thought process. So it sounds like a really cool project. So you said you did a virtual kind of exhibition. Mm-hmm. Is there further plans to um, continue? Um, continue the exhibition, put it up in other cities. Are you planning on doing something in person now? Um, what what, kind of, where is it sitting now? Oh, definitely. Um, this is really only the beginning. Um, you know, it unstoppable is an educational tool and it promotes diversity Mm -hmm. and inclusion. And once again, inspires change. So we hope to have it in some museums. Uh, we have been talking to different groups um, and hoping to coordinate something so that we can uh, do presentations, you know, for either corporations or schools or, you know, there's different possibilities. And I think it's totally it's such an important tool for all those three things, um, inclusion and diversity Um and education. So we have all different um, kind of things um, in the works right now. We did take a bit of a break for our personal lives. Uh, we all volunteer our time. We have um, yeah. other other people that help us. We have, um, you know, uh, probably a group of six of us or so that work on it. So we took a break. Um, we also had hurricane issues to do. <laughs> So yeah. now we're hoping to get back into the swinging thing again. Um, but yeah, this is only the beginning. Well, that's an exciting, exciting thing to hear. I'm glad that it's, you know, getting its, it got its footing, but now it's, it's getting to branch out. Um, so one of the things you mentioned earlier was uh, one of your co-founders with you, Dr. I'm Susan forgetting Solomon. the name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dr. Solomon. Has she felt like she's noticed any differences um, following the campaign of just like, is there more awareness in kind of the, uh, I guess what I would call the collegiate realm of, of teaching these uh, medical professionals? Like, does she feel like it's, it's having an impact already? Oh, definitely. Because, you know, this, this stems really at the base of where medical professionals are trained and educated and you know i can't speak in depth about this but you know susan has been turned away from appointments 
Um, recently, she just went for some tests and was told they couldn't do it because they weren't accessible. They did not provide um, any assistance, which they are supposed to, to get on the inaccessible tables and equipment. And um, so she's experienced this many years, as have I, mm -hmm. which I can give you lots of examples of. Um, so in talking with the students, she's bringing in, and it's something she's doing is unique in the country, where she's bringing in accessible equipment and teaching the students about that and bringing in people with disabilities and having them ask them questions. And so, oh, cool. yeah, the students, she's getting a lot of um, positive feedback through the university and also through the, the students. Um, and I know she's working with some other ways to do this as a kind of a, a pilot throughout the country. Um, so, um, yeah, That's it's really fantastic. exciting. Yeah. And the, the thing is a lot of doctors, you know, they think because they're ADA compliant that they just need to have an accessible bathroom and parking spots. But it's so much more than that. You know, it's it's the equipment, it's the weight scales, it's the, and there's also attitudinal barriers. A lot of, because of the lack of education, they, it, attitudinal is a little bit harder to understand. But um, for example, one of our models, Tamika Spruce, she was told she never needed um a gynecological exam, um, mm. even though she was sexually active. And so finally at 26, she was pregnant and finally got that exam. But, you know, there's can be stereotypes where they think, well, because you have a disability, you're not sexually active. Or, you know, there's these incorrect right. assumptions that can affect your outcome in healthcare. So that's totally. where the education really is important. Yeah, I think, I think that raises I, I mean just from my own perspective it's these are things that i personally until i met you i don't think i would have thought about the fact that um you know if a friend of mine is in a wheelchair that they would have a hard time getting on the exam table at a hospital mm -hmm. um you know these aren't things that cross my mind because i'm not you know actively working um through my own you know disability i i don't have to experience it and so it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. Um, but the mm -hmm. moment it gets brought up, it, I, I can only imagine the number of things in which this poses an issue. Almost every, um, you know, medical examination I can think of would require you to be fully functional and able to move, um, you know, like a, a, I guess what anyone expects you to be able to move. And so it's it's saddening and kind of scary. So I think this project is awesome in the fact that it's it's bringing all of that to light and allowing more people like me, who uh, admittedly are kind of blind and dumb, uh, to the fact that this is a problem. And you know, it makes me realize that that it's an issue that could be fixed um, with the right people behind it. And so uh, it's very exciting to hear just the progress that you've made and where it's headed. Yeah, we have, we have a long way to go, but um, it's a start, you know, helping women find their voices so they can speak up for themselves. You know, uh, for example, to show that we don't get equal and accessible health care. Uh, for example, my husband and I went for a skin exam check, a full body mm -hmm. skin exam. I was a, a new dermatologist and, um, so we went into the room and I could see the table wasn't accessible. It was very, you know, a lot of these tables come up to my shoulder. And so right. the nurse looked at me and said, well, how are we going to do this? And I said, well, I'm going to have to get on the table and get undressed in order to, you know, get off, get my pants off and things I need to be on the table. And she had no idea how I was going to get on the table. And so, um, you know, and that's where the table should have been accessible. They should have provided assistance. But anyway, my husband right. lifted me on the table um, and it was, you know, it was a process. And, but at first the nurse said to me, well, um, you, we'll just do the exam in your chair. And I said, well, how is that possible 
because I need to get undressed and I can't get my pants off in the chair. Yeah. And she said, well, that's okay. Just leave, you can just leave your pants on. I said, but then you can't see my back. You can't see from the waist down. You can't. And she said, well, that's okay. Yeah. I said, but in your lobby, there's a sign saying the importance of being checked everywhere because skin can yeah, I mean, up anywhere. It, it's, I hate to say it comes off as laziness, but it, it's really, it comes across as someone who doesn't, it's almost like so much of an inconvenience that they, they stop caring. And that, that is scary to me knowing that there are medical professionals that are doing that. Well, it's interesting you say that because, well, then my husband went and he, you know, they had him stripped down to nothing. And oh yeah, they checked every <laughs> nook and cranny. And I was, it was just such a, a obvious difference. And, and you can break this down. It's multiple things here. It's, um, they're only given so much time. So we even actually have a model her name is Dr. Sherry Blowett, and she is a Harvard professor and also a physician. And she, um, I'm going to read her statement, actually, because um, she says, I'm a doctor working in the healthcare system that often puts more value on the volume of patients that we see rather than the care we provide. People with disabilities mm -hmm. often experience biases because they re may require more time. So that, you know, I, I knew they were in a hurry. She said they were in a hurry. And so there's that, but then there's also at my end, had I not learned about this through Susan and, you know, reading in the doctor's office, I would have, you know, years ago would have said, oh, good. Okay. I don't have to get undressed. This is easy. It's less hassle for yeah. everybody, including me. And so that's right. why this education is so important. Yeah. Well, and I think that you probably raise a good point too, is I think there's probably a stigma with those who are disabled that it's like, it's almost, I would assume somewhat embarrassing to be like, I just don't want to have to be, I'm going to be the problem when I show yeah. up everywhere I go, I am the problem or I'm, you know, the complication that people don't want to deal with. And it's like, if I can take the easy way, way out, I will. But I think, you know, on top of, giving them the confidence to be like, I am going to be the problem and you are going to do what I need you to do. Right. It's, it's also the fact that they care enough to know that like, I deserve the same level of care as everyone else because I matter and I'm not worried about being, um, you know, nervous or shy or, or, you know, ashamed of, of the situation. And so well, yeah, you don't I can want see to how that mental, no, go for it. You don't want to be the problem, like you say. Plus, you know, sometimes it takes months to get appointments. And and totally. it's a hassle to get to the appointment a lot of times. You have to arrange transportation if you don't have your own. And, and then if you aren't, if you don't have that knowledge and think it's okay, let's just skip this part or let's just not do this. It's not a problem until it becomes a problem. Until, you know, right. as Susan's worked with people where they've, not get the proper, um, they weren't put on a table to get um, a full body exam and ended up with an infection that, you know, was a serious infection because they weren't examined properly. Um, right. And that's when it becomes a problem. And then the other thing is too, and there's an article that came out in October of last year. Uh, and it was about a research scientist, uh, Dr. Lisa Iazoni. And she's... Mm -hmm focused her research on disparities in healthcare for people with disabilities. So, and she has a disability herself, but she interviewed doctors and she said they could be anonymous. They didn't realize on zoom that she was in a wheelchair. And mm. after several um, sessions, they began to admit they don't want to treat people with disabilities. And mm. it was quite shocking in this, um, in this, and I mean, I'm not saying all doctors feel that way, but because of right. the extra time it takes and they're under a time crunch and the lack of equipment, it's just easier not to deal with. And we feel that we feel that as humans, you know, that you don't want to be a problem. Like you say, you, you know, it's right. It's traumatic at times. It's 
there's uh, you know a lot of people that get really upset and um you know i just recently went for a mammogram and yes i finally got the mammogram but it was and it's not that it's pleasant for anybody a mammogram is like you know the worst thing to have to get done at times but Mm -hmm. the person made it so unpleasant and you could tell she really didn't want to do it and you know just it's not fun makes it all the worse yeah Mm -hmm. i mean then it's like it's kind of like when you go to the dentist as a little kid and you have eight cavities and you gotta get a bunch of root canals and then for the rest of your life you hate the dentist because you you know what it all takes is one bad experience and it's like i'm writing it off in my head and that is so so, true that's so true on social media i i you know because we share our message on social media and we have people comment and share their stories and so many women said I just don't want to go back. It was such a traumatic experience. I don't want to go back. Um, one of our yeah. models, she um, went for a pap smear and her name's Kim Bellison and the doctor didn't have an accessible table, didn't know what to do. So he suggested they do the exam on the floor. <laughs> and she just- Oh my word. <laughs> I'm just looking at your face. <laughs> yeah, he-, he just- <laughs> I guess he was trying, right? But, um, you know, she, it it was just demoralizing to her. Um, Well, yeah, that 100%. If my doctor told me to lay on the floor, I'd like, I'd I'd be so confused. I think I'd walk out. That's not our only story as well. We have another model who is a Paralympian who needs to get weighed at, well, everyone needs to get weighed when they go to the doctor's. Um, but right. she lifts herself onto the floor. I mean, this is a woman who, um, Tatiana McFadden has won, you know, many, many marathons and broke many world records. She lifts herself onto the floor, drags herself across the doctor's floor, then lifts herself back onto the scale. Then she holds her legs up in the air and balances on her, her butt. And that's how she gets weighed. Um, but oh she's my probably the only person that can pull that off. Right. Well, she's, you know, put herself in a physically fit scenario where that's capable possible. But at the same time, that should be a, like an absolute red flag to all of the hospital staff of like, oh God, we can't be having this happen. Like, this is ridiculous that this is what she has to jump through to get her weight. You know, you'd, you'd hope that would raise some sort of flag for the staff, but. Well, let's let's go ahead and I, I think we're gonna I got one more question for you and I think we can wrap up. We're sure. we're running right about at time. So I guess my last question for you, Wendy, would be what do you see the future like um for women with disabilities? Like what ten, fifteen years down the road, what is the goal? Where where do you wanna see women with disabilities lives coming to? Um, like what is kind of the hope? Well, we want everyone to get equal and accessible health care. And I know that we aren't planning to give up anytime soon. Um, there's yeah. a lot of agencies out there that are advocating for this as well. Um, but it doesn't have necessarily the cachet that people pay attention as much to. So hopefully with this project, we will be able to get the attention that it deserves. Um, I guess what I would like to see is for it to not be a big deal and for this conversation not to even need to take place. Um, And it just seems like a normal day when you go to the doctors and and everything's fine, you know? Um, It's We just want to be treated like everyone else. And I think that's that rings true for all i think all matter of people no matter the situation or you know the issue that's that's the white elephant in the room per se people just want to be treated the same as everyone else and that's i think it's unfortunate that our society has to deal with the fact that not everybody does that um but it's awesome that you're fighting for it and 
I have to say it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on SpinalCast. So thank you again for joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you for the and opportunity. To, yeah, of course. And everyone listening or watching us on, on YouTube or listening on your favorite podcast platform, we will have links to the Raw Beauty Project and the Raw Beauty Project Health all in the description. Um, we'll have uh, you know a link to the the women mobile women uh facebook group if you're injured and would like to become part of that community um and there's also details on wendy and her little background story down there uh and we just hope everybody can kind of get behind this movement um i'm excited to see where the next exhibition lies i highly suggest people do check out the links because it's 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 definitely a cool grouping of of paintings and and imagery uh that communicates these these messages so wendy thank you again for joining us and uh <laughs> excuse me you're welcome i just wanted to say by the way um our website uh robbeautyproject.com and robbeautyprojecthealth.com yes on the health website which you'll have the link there's a resource section okay and people can go to that section. They can read about the ADA guidelines in terms of healthcare, but there's also links if you want to file a complaint with the Department of Justice um, or Department of Health and Human Services. So that there's different resource links on there. There's one uh, Florida Rights, I think it's called uh, DisabilityRightsFlorida.org. There's other ones that we'll be putting on. And um, through our social media, uh, you know, and website will keep updates if we do do another exhibit and where people can um, see that. So. Awesome. Fantastic. We'll throw social medias down there as well. And once again, thank you, Wendy and everybody at home. Thanks for listening and watching. And uh, we'll talk to you in a month. Thank you. Thank you.